Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. And now we will turn our attention to the outstanding Nate Bauer, who now joins us uh, online. And Nate, to you and your wonderful family and to your golf clubs, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, you just you brought that up and made me sad. I, I put them away. They're in the house. They're out of the trunk. The family or the golf clubs? <laughs> whoa, whoa! <laughs> the old clubs. I got three rounds in last week. It felt Did like a, really? a nice, uh, a nice send off to the. That's yeah, very, very nice. Very nice because. You know, Jack and I drove over to the game on Saturday, and he looked. He says, "Are you putting those bad boys away?" Because they were still in the, in the back of my car. And I said, "Yeah." I says, "I got to give up the ghost." And I said, it's, "You know, I haven't played since sometime in October." So, yeah. There's a there's a Florida trip ahead of me this uh, this winter that I have to look forward to. But uh, other than that, we've yeah. got a lot of thirty degree days coming here. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Okay, so let's get to um, the press conference. Well, I want to get to the game first. Okay. You, you and I, of course, followed intently every game of the Jalen Pickett era here at Penn State. And sure. I said earlier that when I talked to national announcers, they'd come over to shoot around and say, hey, you know, you know because they don't know him. I, you know, I said, what is it about Pickett? And I said, he has the ability in the first five minutes of a game to read the room. What's working? What isn't? And I felt in a football sense on Saturday, I felt like Penn State football and their staff read the room, and that's why we saw the attack we did in the second half. Am I off base there? Is there a different perspective? Um, no, I think that's right. I think, I think sir, look, uh, there's a certain element of of Rutgers being what you think they are, right? I mean, it, yeah. that is not an offense that's, um, you know, really going to confuse you, but also you have to stop them, right? There's still that element of you, you need to uh, win those matchups. And then defensively, yeah, look, I, I, maybe maybe I'm the one reading into things too much, but uh, I see some – or saw what felt to me like some very distinct differences uh, this past week uh, against what had happened the previous 10 weeks. Uh, and, you know, certainly we're, we're talking about an offensive coordinator change in between there, but um, it may feel small using Bo Perbula in the first half, right? Even for a snap, just mm-hmm. to give a different look, integrating him into the game earlier. I believe, uh, you know, we won't know based on how things played out with Drew, but I think that Bo Prabula would have appeared in the second half just yes. as well, w- mm-hmm. with or without uh, you know Drew getting dinged up. Uh, usage of the tight ends, right? Uh, just some of the things that they were trying to do looked, felt different offensively. Uh, and then, obviously, in the second half, once, once, uh, once Drew went down, look, there's, there's a, a real hindsight conversation to have, I feel, about this season for Penn State based on what Bo brings to the offense. Not a conversation about Drew not being the starter, like nothing along those lines, but the notion that Bo does something to defenses that Drew can't, that would have helped Drew would have helped the running backs, would have helped the receivers. I, I think there's a legitimacy to that. Uh, that that is, is going to be interesting to see, you know, how how they explore that this week with Drew expected to be back. What kind of peril does Bo as a quarterback in the running game create because you're not sure which guy has the ball based on how he plays and how the running backs play? I asked, I, asked, uh, I asked Keaton Ellis after the game, and it, it, it sounded like a flippant question. It wasn't intended to be. 
But I asked Keaton Ellis, I said, hey, can Bo throw? Is that, <laughs> can he do that? Right? And he laughed and he said, yeah, of course, like, of course, he's a quarterback. Uh, but then Keaton got into what I was hoping he would get into, which is what how he challenges defenses, meaning you literally just need an extra hat in there. You, you, you got to have an extra guy uh, with an extra gap to be accountable for. And that that is a significant difference to me. Like the, the underlying story here is six explosive runs in the second half. Penn State has not had six explosive runs for games yep. since UMass. Uh, had not had six and a half all season. Okay? So his presence changes what Penn State, the way Penn State can be dynamic in the running game for those two backs. Like that, to me, that's the, that's the thing. It's not about Bo. Yes, he does something with his legs that also helps you. you he can rip off chunk plays, and he did so on Saturday. But mm-hmm. to me, the, the real conversation or the meat of the conversation is, hey, uh, when he's in the game, he creates an avenue for the running backs that Drew can't when they do uh, read option. All right, so they do get to this game uh, against Michigan State on Friday night. Uh, this is an opportunity for a 10th win, an opportunity at a New Year's Six Bowl game. Those are the opportunities. You're talking to fans all the time. Is mm-hmm. it really all just uh, Michigan and Ohio State and there's no perspective after that? What is it? Um, it's It's complicated because I think when you get through the – the immediate gratification of the disappointment, right? That, look, no one will argue against the notion that Penn State wants to get over the top against those sure, two teams. That is course. a huge piece of this. No doubt. Is the feeling, is the, and, it, and it is a legitimate feeling, yeah. that this is a program that has had undeniable success, okay? Under James Franklin, we're looking at uh, – the potential here for five of the past eight years having double-digit wins. I don't care what you say about the strength of the Big Ten. I don't care what you say about the non-conference schedule. That is an accomplishment. And when, if you're being honest with yourself, you wipe out the COVID year, that's five out of seven. That is right. that is tremendous in terms yes. of success. Yes. However, however, yeah. mm-hmm. the feeling of plateau, uh, of having hit a place and not making strides beyond it. As, as remarkable as that success is and consistent as that success is, uh, they want to win a championship. They want, they want to get to the playoffs. James, James Franklin wants to get to the playoffs. <laughs> these, these, are, these are absolutely worthy aspirations for the program. And so this year, depending on what happens on Friday, if they get to 10-2, and two, Right. will end up feeling for a, a lot of people like a disappointment. Is it is it dejection? I think that will, will taper off, to be honest with you. I think over the offseason, and a lot of it, this is super interesting to me, is the draw of the bowl game. Right? Like, right. Who do you get in sure. the bowl? If you, if right. you get Alabama and lose to Alabama, your season means that you didn't beat anyone good. Right? You had three chances to beat someone good. That, in terms of what, how people would perceive that. If you beat Alabama or get a team of that caliber in the bowl and win that game, it, it to me, I think transforms opinions. It totally changes how people look at the Big Ten next year, right? It Welcoming Oregon and some of those teams from, from the West Coast, uh, it, it changes all of that. But to, to a similar vein, if you draw Tulane in a bowl, it won't matter what you do. Right? Like right. people's perceptions will be uh, completely uh, dictated by what the game is, who you're playing, and what the outcome of uh, of that game is. Yeah. Uh, what was the general feel that you got out of the press conference uh, with with James? Yeah. Look, I, I, I mean, and it was interesting because it, it kind of got brought to a head 
right, is that he left breadcrumbs as to why Mike Yurcich is no longer the offensive coordinator at Penn State. Mm-hmm. So he did yes. it throughout. He did it through. He did it throughout the press conference. There were dots to connect, and at some point, uh, he was asked, "Hey, are we connecting these dots correctly? Does does this mean that that you were uh, if if you were happy with the collaboration, if you were happy with?" the fact that the the playbook was whittled down and more concise. If you were happy with those things, does that mean you were unhappy with the prior arrangement? And look, this is just the way that he is, uh, and I don't blame him for it in, in a public position. I think he wants to be able to leave those breadcrumbs and have people read between the lines. I know for a fact that he doesn't want to have to come out and say it explicitly. Right. So when he was when he was asked that, he said, "Look, if if you're asking me in a way that only creates an opportunity for me to say things uh, in a divisive way, he's not going to do it." <laughs> so the, the the end result is, look, all of this is messy. All of this is complicated. It there there is no singular event or singular reason why you make a change within your coaching staff, but if everyone is paying attention, and I think everybody is, particularly this week, mm-hmm. you're you're saying, okay, what are the things that were different this week from last week? What is he saying about those differences, uh, and what does that mean for how things were prior to that? And I think it I think it it completely opens the window. It's it's is it about Ohio State and Michigan and the the past six performances under Mike Yersich against those two teams? Absolutely, that is a huge piece of this puzzle. But there are other pieces around it saying, hey, uh, the, the, the way the – I mean, what, what did he say, Steve? The way the script – right, the, having the play script for the game uh, yeah. ahead of time, having right. the look right. offensively for the scout team. Yeah. Like, I mean, there, there's just a litany yeah. Yeah. Of, of things uh, and that he felt had improved from the prior arrangement to this week. And – uh, you know, I think I think it says a lot about uh, about what he wanted to do and where he's taking this. Yeah, play scripts, cards, things like that that you need for practice. Uh, basketball uh, will play Thanksgiving Day against Texas A and M. They're four zero. They were expected to be four zero. Texas A and M is four zero. They were expected to be four zero. The odd thing is when you you know I've obviously done the prep on the game. They're not shooting the ball well, Texas A and M. And Penn State's mm-hmm. been okay at shooting it. Uh, mm-hmm. So what do we find out out of this tournament based on the level of competition? Because either way, they're going to play Butler or Florida Atlantic in game two Friday. Yep, we're going to find out a lot. <laughs> we're going to find out a lot. I, I think that there are levels to that, right? Uh, but the first one to me is, do they belong on the same floor? Is that is, yeah. is this the caliber of Penn State team that, that we're talking about? I have reservations to that. I, I, I would guess that you do too. Um, you know, in terms of the personnel that Penn State has, it is such a new collection in its entirety that it is difficult, even having played the competition that they have, to really get a, a full grasp and understanding of what it's going to look like against teams that are more capable than the opponents that they've played thus far. I don't think Lehigh's a joke, right? No, I, I don't think Lehigh's right. a bad team. Uh, right. and, and you learn something about this Penn State team's makeup being in that situation of being in a tie game at half and coming out and doing the things that they did in the second half to win that game. You, you've learned things along the way, um, but there's, there's, just a, there's just a lot of questions to answer. Is right Penn State's defensive... Uh, full court press, the things that they were doing uh, this past Friday against Morehead State, is that effective against Texas A&M? How much are they going to pull that out? I I have no clue. I have no idea what the ability of other, of opponents that Penn State will face this season is to break that press. (laughs) Do do, do those teams have guards that can do it on their own? Or do you have to be organized? Do you have to have uh, that down? So it's going to be super interesting for me to see that. And then, look, I, I, being honest about what I think this Penn State team is, uh, we have seen enough evidence to say, you know what, 
Tanya Clary, Ace Baldwin can get to the rack when they want. Uh, yeah. They're going to do that this year. They will be met by different resistance in terms of the paint than they have seen thus far this season. And so it becomes incumbent on Zach Hicks, Leo O'Boyle, uh, and Puff Johnson to knock down threes. Jameel Brown, right? To, for those guys, they play an inside-out game. Penn State, like, you can see this from a mile away, what they're going to do. It's just a matter of, okay, when you're playing these better opponents who are going to have better help defense, better perimeter defense, are your guys going to knock down those shots? They have got to do that. Uh, and it's going to be super interesting to see this weekend whether or not that's a component that's there yet or if that's something that's still to be developed. Right. And that's what they're, that's exactly what we're about to find out because they have the, at, you know, based on the polls, Texas A&M's 13, Florida Atlantic's 10. Somebody asked me about yeah. Florida Atlantic today, so you don't realize, like, their top six guys, the five starters plus their six men, they're all back. I mean, nobody left. And, <laughs> and there, there's, there's teams on the other side of the draw, regardless uh, of what happens. Oh, my goodness, There's teams yeah. on the other side of the draw that are tough, too. <laughs> so yeah. they, I mean, they are going to get three high-quality looks at, at teams that might not play a Big Ten brand of basketball necessarily, but they're, they're going to give you a, a, a very, very good litmus test uh, as a program where you stack up right now. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, back to Penn State. Uh, playing this game on a Friday, you've got Kalen, Kobe King, Cast Tech. You've got uh, Jalen Reed, MLK. They're Detroit guys. Uh, they're playing a team that's won two of its last three games. What's your just general thought on the game Friday? Yeah, well, look, I, it's the same that I had this past week, which is you have to win this game. You have to win yeah, this game. Yeah, no everybody, doubt. Everybody, everybody's so fixated. Look, Steve, during the game, the, the conversation about stunting Bo's development by not letting him pass the ball, right? That like, that is literally a thought that people had: is oh, they're just not letting him pass the ball. They had passes in there; right? there were there were designed passes, sure. uh, but there are POs, and Bo pulls it a lot. That, that's yeah. just something that he does. He he takes the run option. Uh, it is it is about nothing else. Development. All of that other stuff is totally fine. It is a bonus if you can get it. This game is about winning the game, putting yourself in exactly. the top 12 for yep. the CFP, and then going to a New Year's Six game and letting things fall out from there. So I, I, I very much felt as though the conversation after Michigan – uh, from from externally, I'm not saying this is a, a reflection of what's happening internally, but externally, this notion that these games are just foregone conclusions, uh, it is not, <laughs> it is not at all. Uh, uh, you gotta yeah. you gotta win the game, period. Yeah, that's you know, I tell my broadcasting class all the time. You start at zero, you prepare every game, no matter regardless of what the opponent is as to whether it will go be a blowout and re- prepare every game as if it's going to go down to the last play because you don't know what kind yep. of game you're going to get. Yep. That's, and it I, is, think that, it is I thought that was hard. good advice for them. <laughs> you, you, you have that sage wisdom. It's great. But it, 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 it's true internally as well. This is, uh, this is a game that, yes, you are expected to win. Then mm-hmm. they know that. However... Mm-hmm doing it Thanksgiving week on a short week when nobody's on campus, right? Like the, the human element of some of this stuff does come into play. And it, it this is a grind at this point in the season. You are looking yes, forward is. to that week after mm-hmm. the season ends where it's, it's not bowl prep yet and you're just done for a little yeah. bit. So yeah. they got to get through this. If they play their brand of football, if, if, if the defense is the same – guys that they've been if the offense you know builds on last week and turns it into uh you know something two weeks in a row you you got a you got a great chance to win that game and then you can you can worry about the rest from there my friend i know you have a uh, zoom conference to get in on uh you jumped in last minute i always appreciate that and in all sincerity all kidding aside happy thanksgiving to you and that great family of yours thank you so much and the same to you i look forward to uh 
seeing you soon. I, I won't be in Detroit, but uh, I, I will catch you soon enough, I'm sure. Sounds great. Thanks, Nate. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Nate Bauer on 3.com, Blue White Illustrated.